You're listening to the Women's Hope Podcast of the Masters University with Dr. Shelby Cullen and Kimberly Cummings. Join them as they bring hope and encouragement through 25 years of combined experience in biblical discipleship and counseling as ACBC counselors. Shelby and Kimberly provide biblical and practical wisdom by coming alongside women with the teaching and resources necessary to grow in the grace and the knowledge of their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to the Women's Hope Podcast. Hello, Shelby. Hello, Kim. How are you today? I am wonderful. Well, I have to let the audience know you are our birthday girl. Oh. <laughs> so happy belated birthday. Thank you, got you so to, much. Yeah. You got to celebrate your birthday yesterday with your family. Mm-hmm. What a blessing. You are a blessing to so many. Oh, so Thank you, Kim. You yeah. are too. Thank oh. you for saying that. Well, speaking of blessings, Shelby, we are so excited to uh, have a very, very special guest. And I have to say very, very, <laughs> because he is not just my brother in Christ. He is also a personal friend. And I want to introduce and welcome Pastor Philip DeCourcy on our show today. Philip, welcome. Kim, uh, Shelby, it's a delight to join you on the podcast. And uh, just echoing your comments, Kim, uh, we have a little bit of history together. And David and myself went through the Master's Seminary. Both enjoyed that and suffered that together. And uh, <laughs> you and your family were with us at Placerita for several years. So for June and I... Um, the Cummings family holds some great memories, and uh, I certainly look back on those, t- those times as formative and and something to be treasured. And I think we did something there at Placerita Baptist together that uh, continues to this day. So it's a it's a joy to be with you. And I think Shelby, you and I have crossed paths a couple of times. So thankful for you and your ministry there on the campus of TMU. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. You know, Philip, I have a, a little bit of a funny story uh, we actually discovered Placerita Baptist because we went to go hear someone else preach because you were on vacation. Oh, now you tell me. <laughs> well, but the funniest part of that is, is I was actually gone to, to be honest, I forgot about that part. And David had gone to hear uh, Dr. Barrick speak. And then we came back. And uh, you were still on vacation and we're getting back shortly after I I got back. And my husband said, if this pastor doesn't stink it up, I think we're going to come to this church. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I crossed the low bar. and um, <laughs> But hey, I don't blame you. I'd go and hear Dr. Berwick before myself. I mean, when you, look, when you look back at that time, Kim, I mean, at that time in Placerita's history, I mean, um, we kind of had the who's who, you know, Dr. John Hughes. We had Mike Crisanti. We had Dr. Berwick. And um, those were just fantastic times. It was something to stand before those men and preach. And yet mm-hmm. both Mike and, and Bill, uh, you know, they, 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 they wanted scholarship. They wanted me to be true to the text, but they weren't sitting as critics. They were sitting as men who wanted to hear the word of God, disciples, servants of Christ. And, you know, God has moved you on and moved us on. And, and, and we love what we're doing here in Orange County. But I'll tell you, um, a smile comes to our face when, when June and I get to talking about Placerita Baptist. Well, we're the same way, friend. We are. And, you know, we fell in love with that sweet little church family and you as well. And you all loved us. Uh, you nurtured us. You discipled us. And you prepared us for our first church by allowing us to serve and grow at Placerita. And we just have really fond uh, memories and and we're filled with gratitude of those opportunities and you know when we left there were many tears shed but the mm. lord specifically used you and your wife june to prepare us for ministry and we consider that time with real fondness and i'm just so thankful that the lord brought our paths together and uh used us as a as teammates to serve our lord um, it was just a really sweet time. And, you know, that's why I, when I saw that you had this little booklet come out, I just knew that this would be a helpful tool for women. And I jumped on the opportunity to have you on the show. So I want to share, Philip, a little bit about your ministry, and then we'll just jump right into the interview. As you mentioned, you're, as well as an author, you are also a pastor, but you are a teacher on Know the Truth, which is a media ministry 
whose passion and purpose is to acclaim and proclaim God's eternal truth that is found in the Holy Scriptures. And uh, Philip's messages originate from his Bible teaching at Kindred Community, and they're centered upon the work and the person of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And the ministry of Know the Truth is shared daily on the radio, on the website, ktt.org, as well as digital media platforms and in print. And Philip, you boldly proclaim the truth that all can be set free and enjoy God fully and freely forever through the work of Jesus Christ. Um, I have the app on my phone, KTT app, so that I can listen to your messages and they are a blessing to me. So Know the Truth has released your book. It was released on March 1st, and our listeners can receive their own copy by going to ktt.org and get the details there. And I think there's also a little free gift that they get with the book. So be sure to uh, get this little treasure in your hands, women. It is definitely a blessing. Yeah, and uh, one of the reasons that we are having Pastor DeCourcy on today is because of this wonderful little book. So let me just give you the title. It has a fun title, I must admit. It's called, it's entitled, You Go Girl, How Women Build the Church. (laughs) And um, as I was reading through it, um, I was really uh, just uh, enjoyed it very much. And I, it really highlighted um, three Ps, which is a perfect pastor (laughs) outline, quite honestly, but it really- It was on the slave day alliteration. (laughs) (laughs) Alliteration's good. I, I, I definitely like to incorporate that into my teaching. I learned from all the pastors out there, but- it really helps um, the reader, I think, think through those three Ps, and they are purpose, prominence, and participation of women in the Bible as a model for Christian women. And so, you know, Kim and I really appreciate uh, what you've contributed um, in this impactful read, Pastor DeCourcy. And, um, you know, I know just coming from firsthand experience, there's just boatloads of material out there that address this topic of complementarianism. Mm -hmm. Some are very, very helpful. I've really appreciated uh, what's been written out there, but some are not so helpful Mm -hmm. and not very biblical at all. And I think uh, for sure that we agree with you that there's just often a misunderstanding of just the topic of complementarianism, and even in the best of churches. Um, And I've seen two extremes, actually. Either the leadership defaults to overreacting believing that women are greatly undervalued in the church, and they kind of buy into what I I label as a soft complementarianism, Mm -hmm. where women can do everything that unordained men can do in the church, even if that means they're given uh, the title pastor, because they kind of see it more as a a title, title of giftedness. And so therefore, you know, things happen. The implications are they might teach a mixed Sunday school class or something like that. Or, as they point out in your book, um, or as you point out in your book, sometimes churches, even with the best of intentions, overemphasize what women are prohibited from doing. I've definitely seen that. Prohibited from doing in the church, in home, and even in society at large. And although most of those prohibitions are biblical and they're accurate, as you point out, sometimes that emphasis can send the wrong message because it obscures the Bible's teaching on the priesthood of all believers. And so the impact, as you say in your little booklet, is it puts women in a box, relegating us to just the kitchen and the kids, and in your words, limiting um, the breadth and beauty of what they can do for the good of the church and the glory of Christ. Um, So Kim and I were just wondering if maybe with that in mind, maybe just expanding on what you mean by that statement of how we are overemphasizing the differences and failing to understand God's teaching on the priesthood of all believers. And include in that statement, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of balancing our thinking maybe a little bit better on women's roles um, within the local church. Shelby, thank you. And, and you're right. I think there are extremes. And, and so what I set out to do was strike a balance. I mean, it's a 33-page booklet. It's it's not historic. You don't need to stop the presses. It's not going to, you know, change church history. On the other hand, you know, there's a lot of books out there. Some are large. Uh, some are polemic in nature. Some are, you know, uh, arguing, and I'm thankful for that, for 
the distinction uh, in, in roles and function uh, as we see it biblically, what we had called the doctrine of complementarianism. And so, you know, my, this booklet really it strikes, tries to strike a balance. I trained under a pastor in Belfast, ladies called Freddie McLaughlin. I, I think Kim may have met him on, on a visit to, to Plas Rita, but he always had this little statement that, you know, the forgotten beatitude or blessed are the balanced. And, and, and that's what this booklet's trying to do. And I'm trying to bring balance to the overcorrection, I think, given where the culture's at, given the increase of, of um, egalitarianism in, in the church. Um, pastors are on their heels, and rightly so. We want to defend biblical complementarianism. So thankful for men like John MacArthur, John Piper, Wayne Grudem, um, Owen Strachan, who are at that kind of uh, on the front lines of, of saying, no, uh, here's what the Bible teaches. But I think there's a, there's a danger that, that as uh, we, we, we state the doctrine of complementarianism and we preach womanhood in, in a manner that at times, maybe not realizing it, is too negative um, because we are on the defense increasingly, the culture uh, you know, and and the, the 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 compromise that's going on in the church has us fighting for a biblical view of complementarianism. But we've got to be careful that we're not always in that mode, and 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 that's really the genesis of the books, the book, ladies. I mean, I, to run with this for a moment, there was kind of three things drove it. It was a pastoral concern. Uh, I was invited a, a several a couple of years ago before the pandemic to address the issue with uh, the women here at Kindred Community Church. And so as a pastor, I wanted to commend them. I wanted them to see, as you said, Shelby, the breadth and the beauty of their calling in Christ as women. Um, uh, something beyond motherhood, which is a precious thing, and I hold that high. Um, but I wanted them to see the breadth of what God has called them to, the beauty of that. I mean, if I believe... Proverbs 31, that a godly woman, a virtuous woman, is a treasure. I want to treasure that as a, both as a husband to June, um, and I want to treasure that as a pastor to the ladies in our church. Paul directly addressed women in Titus 2, among other passages. And so I wanted them to hear my heart uh, as a complimentarian. They knew what they couldn't be. It was clear at Kenry Community Church we will not suffer a woman to teach uh, the church broadly. We will not suffer a woman to take authority over a man within the church. But I wanted them to hear something positive. So I was driven pastorally to that. There was a personal concern. You know, I, I, I make a bit of a, a joke of it in, in, the, in the book where I've lived my whole life on a girl's dorm, dormitory. Um, you know, I've got three daughters, and now I've got a granddaughter, Lily, who's the joy of my life. And so, you know, I've, I've sought as a father to, to let my girls know that uh, God has a wonderful calling in their life. Certainly a, a big part of that may be marriage and being a, a, a you know, a worker at home, Titus 2. Uh, that's certainly a baseline. And we've, we've taught our girls that two of them are single and desiring that. Uh, but, but I wanted to go beyond that. I also want them to, to, them to know that I want them to be strong in Christ. I want them to be vibrant. I don't want them cowering or feeling that submission to biblical leadership or to ultimately to a husband means that there's something less, uh, that they kind of walk around with their head down looking at their feet. No, God has called them to be strong women, uh, independent in, in, in the best sense of that. Um, call them to use their spiritual gifts, call them to express the priesthood that they have in Jesus Christ. That's not the preserve of man. Stop there. I'll let you come back in on that. And then the last kind of concern or the last kind of thing that drove me, ladies, was, was a polemic concern, right? A pastoral concern, a personal concern, and a polemic concern in that I think part of our polemics is to fight uh, on the negative side, and 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 you know, argue for what women can do, and, and what God has 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 put certain boundaries around them concerning the home and uh, ministry and life. On the other hand, I want the polemic to be positive. I want the culture to know, and I want the church to know 
that that the Bible has a positive, broad, um, beautiful portrait uh, of of what God wants a woman to be. I, I mention in the book an, an article my daughter Be- Angela sent me by Michael Kruger. I think at the time, I, I guess he still is uh, president of Reformed Seminary, I think in the Carolinas. And, and he did an article on, on the church in the second century, which was kind of his theological focus. And, and what struck me about the article was he, he brings out this, you know, the Roman Empire was two-thirds men, one-third women, but the church within the empire was two-thirds women, one-third men. And, and I want that po- I want to address that polemic that the church has always been and still is a haven for women. It's a place where women uh, are, are protected, uh, they're valued, they're treasured, and, and say no more than that. And, and my booklet just tries to strike that balance. It's it's complementarian, but I don't spend a lot of time there. I state that I'm a complementarian. I'm in the school of of MacArthur and Piper and Grudem, um, but I but it, but I want to just write a little booklet for my for the women of our church, for my daughters and my granddaughter, uh, my wife, and my my female friends, and also hopefully it's a a little bit of a gift to the church to use so that we can counterman and counteract this narrative in the culture that the church is against women, um, has suppressed women. Nothing could be further from the truth. So come back to me on that, and we'll, we'll, Shelby will also come back to the idea of priesthood, which I'd love to get into. Sounds great. But does any anything there resonate? All of it. All, <laughs> all three of it. Piece, the yeah. polemic. <laughs> yeah. Just teasing. Philip, just to... To mention uh, Freddie, we actually stayed at his house about 20 years ago. So, yeah, right. I forgot that. Yeah, yeah. So that was a blessing. But we had also met him here in the States. But yeah, I remember him well. And you know, I don't know if you remember, Linda was his wife. Mm-hmm. And, and you talk about, you know, strong womanhood and yet submiss- a submissive wife and, and a great servant of Christ. Linda McLaughlin. Uh, not only mentored my wife, I can say honestly, Linda McLaughlin mentored me in that in that Priscilla Aquila kind of role. Um, she's got a keen mind. She's widely read theologically. Uh, we often joked to, to Freddie's, uh, you know, a detriment that she was a better theologian than he was because he was A-mill and she was pre-mill. Um, but, but she was a wonderful <laughs> woman who mentored my wife. But I, that, I was so glad early on in my pastoral ministry, that I was trained under a couple where he was a, a strong complementarian and the church was well led, but but he had a wife that was strong and 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 was a wonderful minister of the gospel and a servant of Christ in the bread the bre- the broad sense of that and and impressed me and reminded me of of what women should be and can be and uh, so Freddie you know lived that balance and and modeled it. That's that's great, and and I appreciate that a lot because we're both strong women, and we're readers theologically. We love reading um, books that stretch us and challenge us to think about our Lord and Savior, and and we get to utilize those things as life givers. And that's one of the things that you mention in your booklet, Philip. And so I want you to talk a little bit about life giving because you mentioned the difference between. Uh, the difference of giving birth and giving life as women. And this was a quote that you used from Susan Hunt. And I've read much of her material and and enjoy reading her as well. But when it comes to for fulfilling our created purpose, um, this issue of being a life giver, I want you to expand on that and the value of that, of using your giftedness um, and your God-given skills, everything we have comes from the Lord. I woke up this morning. Lord, thank you. I have breath to breathe to serve you. You know, everything we have comes from him. But specifically, I want you to talk about the context of the local church as women being life givers. Well, I'm glad to do that. You know, the first chapter of the book deals with the purpose of women. And 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 it really focuses on two descriptors descriptions or descriptors of women in Genesis the one we know well is is helper 
and we and I get into that, and and that certainly is a calling uh, uh, from the Lord that you know Eve was created to be Adam's helper, uh, but we 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 want to you know qualify that it, she was his helper, not his help. And I think at times we have allowed the word helper to kind of descend into that idea of help. You know, kitchen kids, uh, everything domestic. But but even in the context of Genesis, uh, it was it was more than that. Uh, she was his his, uh, you know, counterpart, she was called alongside and under her husband to manifest dominion over the earth, right? Genesis 1, it gets into that. So that's where her help is. It's not, it's not just the domestic side and the home, although that's glorious and unnecessary. Um, she was called to be his helper, uh, one under him and alongside him to help manifest dominion over over the, over the world it was more than childbearing much more which led me to this idea of life giver because eve is described as the life giver the mother of the living right genesis 3:20 and again that title was given to her prior to childbirth and, and undoubtedly uh, childbirth is 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 at the heart of that uh, that's one of the unique roles of a woman and how crazy and confusing has our culture become when we can't even acknowledge that only women can have children? Because one of their God-given gifts, biologically, uh, they they give birth, and and um, you know and that's the horror of abortion and all of that. But but it's not just biological; it's functional. She's a life giver biologically, but she's a, also a life giver functionally. And, and the, the chapter one of the book gets into that. And I want to cheerlead uh, my wife, my daughters, the women of Kindred Community Church, the listeners of KTT, whoever's uh, in, in interacting with this, this broadcast, and that, that God has called them to be life givers. Um, you see that in, in the Proverbs 31 woman. Um, she enriches all stratas of life, all sections of society. She's a blessing to her husband. He trusts in her. Uh, he treasures her. She, she's um, a blessing to her children who call, who rise up later in life to call her blessed because they know that their mother's fingerprints are all over their life. And whatever success they're enjoying, their mother enhanced that and brought that about. She manages the home well. Uh, she's good to her maid servants. She's generous to the poor. Uh, she's involved in in local commerce. If you go through Proverbs thirty one, there's this back to Shelby's noting this little breadth and beauty. She's in the home. She takes care of the home. She's a worker at home, but that doesn't define her completely. And and her life giving spirit, her her life giving influence is felt at home on the street, in the neighborhood, within the community. Even, even you know, those who sit at the city gate and in that culture that spoke of the, the movers and the shakers, they were aware of her and her husband and her family. And, and I just love that and, and, and want to kind of underscore that life-giving element. And then just to quickly touch on the local church aspect, that would take us to this idea of priesthood. You know, complementarianism, and our belief in the submission of women, both to, to male leadership in the church and male leadership in the home, um, that does not negate priesthood. And again, we're back to this balance. Let's state the negative. Let's state the prohibition. Let's state the boundaries. But let's remember that the women of our church, women in Christ are equally priests before God. Um, in Christ, they are priests. Uh, the whole church, men and women, uh, are, are a priesthood. All right, First Peter two nine. We're a kingdom of priests. Revelation one five to six, and and that's a biblical evangelical Protestant doctrine. We've got to come back to it and remind ourselves our complementarianism does not negate the priesthood of women in our church. Uh, they have got spiritual gifts that we've got to help them discover and apply. They are full participants in the fulfillment of the Great Commission. It, it's so important that, that we see that and, and we help women to see 
the breadth of what God has given. Here's here's an interesting thought, if I can steal a little bit more time. I, I, I want as a pastor to help them see that breadth, both as a life giver in all aspects, social and spiritual. I want them to see that while there are boundaries uh, to the expression of their fullness in Christ and their priestly calling, the breadth of what's left, and we'll get into that in chapter three, is broad. And I think I thought I thought about this, Kim and, and Shelby. This be something interesting to think about. Tell me if you agree or disagree on this. Iron sharpening iron. It's interesting to me when you go back to the origin, when you go back to Eve and her fall into sin, and how she was first deceived. Satan had Eve focused on the one thing she couldn't do. Right. And he had and he blinded her to the breadth of what she could do. Right. Genesis 2, 16 to 17, God says, right, of all the trees in the garden, you can eat. Have at it. Go, girl. And and think about all the trees, the the breadth of that, the beauty of that, the satisfaction of that, God's generosity to Eve. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you can't touch. Someone has said that sin was predicated on a role reversal. I think there's some merit to that. But what I find interesting is that Eve was tempted by Satan to focus on the thing that God prohibited and put boundaries around. And I want, I hope I'm, I hope I'm right in this theologically. It, it struck me just recently and, 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 and encouraged me in, in that I'd written the book. I want in this little booklet to say, to the women I know and the women who are impacted by my ministry, avoid the temptation. Okay, you can't be a pastor. You can't be an elder. You can't be a, uh, you know, you can't lead your home. But, 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 but Satan is at work. If he has you stewing on that stuff and distracting you from the beauty and the breadth of what you can do, that does, does that make sense? Yeah, it it makes sense um, because what I'm thinking through as you're talking is I'm realizing that uh, the temptation is just coveting what you don't have. It's that covetousness, and mm-hmm. I could see. And you know, I'm in, I'm just encouraged by what you're saying. I am thinking about myself and just interacting in ministry and just how wonderful it is when a pastor desires to shepherd you in that way where. They're not threatened by your giftedness, and they want you to employ those gifts, and they they help to shepherd what that would look like in the local church. That is a balanced view, and mm-hmm. it's wonderful, mm-hmm. and I just really appreciate that. You know, and, you know, and I'm growing in it. I, I don't want to come across like I've been doing this from day one. Right. Uh, you know, I think I've been imbalanced at times. I think I have stated the negative too much, and uh, I certainly will fight the good fight. Uh, when a, a biblical view of roles comes under attack. But, I, but you know, just watching my girls grow, discipling them, uh, being confronted by my failures as a father and as a pastor to them, and, and, and just taking that journey with them, hearing them, I, I think, you know, I've matured in that. And, and I think even we're on a journey as a church to try and strike that balance. So we have got Certainly no pastors or elders on staff. In fact, it's still our position here at Kindred that only men can be deacons. I, I am open to the idea of deaconesses. That's not a hell I'll die on. I just take the interpretation of 1 Timothy 3 to be the wife of a deacon. But on staff here, uh, we've got, uh, you know, well over a dozen women on full pay here at the church working in it, both administrative roles, coming alongside pastors to serve them. And, and release them uh, to do ministry. Um, we have got a, a wonderful uh, lady, Leah, uh, working uh, under our pastor of children's and family, helping there. And then my own daughter, Beth, is full-time um, uh, helping serve uh, families with disability. And uh, so we've, we've had a couple of conversations, Shelby, as a pastoral staff, to make sure that none of that is tokenism. And, and you know, we just don't, well, you know, should we, should we come under scrutiny? Well, look, we've got women in the office. Uh, yes, we've got women in the office, but we want to make sure that within biblical boundaries that that, that they have a seat at the table. Uh, we can learn from them. We need to listen to them. Ultimately, we'll lead. But all of that is, is going on. I think that's a balance uh, we can strike as complementarians. We're never going to satisfy 
you know, those who are in rebellion. We're never going to satisfy a godless culture. We're never going to satisfy perhaps those in the evangelical church, sadly, with a, an egalitarian agenda. But, but I think we can, in, in striking a balance and, and, and valuing manifestly uh, women uh, around us as, as men and as Christian leaders, we can hold our girls and, and, and our women and let them know that uh, God's way is best. And when we live in his boundaries, that's not prison, that's freedom. Yeah, right. I mean, honestly, we just want to be biblical Christians, don't we? I mean, that's just, it's wonderful to be shepherded right. in that way and to realize that and not covet something that the Lord hasn't given you. I mean, it's its wonderful. And so if we're all on the same page, um, and I think it's wonderful to have opportunities to um, share and, and give opinions on things, but ultimately, if we're really understanding the way scripture teaches, we will be fine with how it's led in the end. You know what I mean? Absolutely. It's, it's, it's great. I mean, I just really appreciate um, everything you've said, um, Pastor Philip. And would do, so do you mind, so, so since we're on the topic of not erring on the side of focusing too much on what women cannot do, maybe you'd like to share some of the examples of women that you used in uh, your second chapter, I believe, that were around during Christ's ministry. Um, you said in that chapter, I believe, that Jesus had a high regard for women that wasn't really even normative in that day. It was quite radical. Um, and so how can even the Lord's view just bring us back to the center? I really appreciate that it flows out of that. Um, how can we be more balanced in that sense, just through even those examples you used? Well, again, back, let's be biblical. If we're going to be biblical as biblicists, then, I mean, in chapter two, I look at the Old and New Testament, but if we just focus on Christ. I mean, let's remind ourselves, right? One of the purposes and passions of our life is to be Christ-like, right. both in action and in attitude. And when you read the Gospels, uh, you do see that Christ was countercultural. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I, I mentioned in, in, in that chapter that, you know, even within his genealogy, um, mm -hmm. You've got Rahab and Ruth, or uh, you know, you've got the story of his mother Mary and and, and Elizabeth outshining their husbands <laughs> in, in in some respects in terms of their faith and their submission and their trust uh, in God. It, often Jesus in his parables um, makes women the hero. Uh, you know, the the persistent widow who goes to the unjust judge looking for justice is a model of how we ought to um, go to God in prayer, not to overcome his reluctance, but to lay hold of his willingness. Uh, you've got the parable of, of the, the ten virgins. You know, you've got Jesus instructing women, uh, which the rabbis of his day didn't do. Uh, in Luke 10, 38 to 42, you've got Mary sitting at his feet, hearing his word. Uh, we've got Jesus healing uh, women, we've got that friendship with Martha and Mary that seemed to be a, a special thing, and he loved uh, going going to their homes. You've got that band of women, right, who followed him and ministered to him, according to Luke 8, 1 to 3, uh, with, with financially. You know, even in the story of the cross and the resurrection, it's striking to me, and I make reference to this, that it was women who were last to leave the cross, Okay, and they were first to arrive uh, at, at the empty tomb. We don't want to overstate that. It's not that women aren't sinners and never do anything wrong, but it's interesting that Christ never named or denounced a woman, a woman for acting against him. And and so you know when you go through that, you know you, you see this. I, I I make you know John MacArthur states I, I quoted in the book that women in pagan societies during biblical times were often treated with little more dignity than animals uh, greek philosophers taught that women were inferior creatures the roman empire allowed personal possessions to be uh, the preserve of uh, husbands and fathers alone and then christianity comes along and intersects with the east and the west and jesus includes women as his disciples treats them with utmost dignity and exalts the, the whole the whole you know position of of womanhood and and you see that spilling over into the book of Acts with women in the upper room uh, with with women mentioned throughout the the history of the church Dorcas and Priscilla uh, Priscilla and uh, so on and so forth and then you've got Paul addressing women in Crete directly through in an apostolic letter and and just that 
must strikers. I mean, um, we've got to come back to that with some fresh eyes and, and, and see the prominence of women. Well, I think it's Diane Severance in, in has a wonderful book published by Christian Focus. It's called The Feminine Thread. And I, I you know, I love that image that it, the tapestry of scripture is woven with feminine threads. We're within redemptive history. Uh, God used women. They, they weren't bit actors. They weren't, they didn't play simply a supportive role. They played leading roles within redemptive history. And we've got to cheer that and we've got to replicate that in our lives. Philip, back to what you mentioned about Eve. I agree with you 110%. And actually, that is what my husband has taught, as well as I have taught my women, is look at all of these beautiful things that God has given us that we can do. Why do we focus on the one thing that he says, thou shalt not? And But that's been throughout history, right? We see that, you know, <laughs> with um, the, the Decalogue, you know, it's like the more rules given, we tend to try to, to either make more or break more, right? Um, but we're to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yeah, that's the heart. It, uh, right. We've got to keep coming back to the goodness and wisdom of God. Absolutely. I think it was Warren Wearsby said something that I've, that I've kind of kept. God gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. Mm. And in God's wisdom, God's neither male nor female, right? He's spirit. But as he created us in his, in, in, in his image and, and created us male and female, God, you know, put the mantle of leadership in that ultimate sense upon the shoulders of man. We should only want what God wants for us because what God wants for us is always best. And we've got to remind ourselves, I want to remind ladies, not only is, you know, as my friend my friend Mark Hitchcock reminded me recently, such a simple thought, you know, um, the call to eldership and the call to pastoral leadership is not only prohibited to women in their totality, it's prohibited to most men within the church also, right? I mean, James 3 warns men, don't be after being a teacher. Don't desire that. Don't go looking after that. Don't go running for that because you're going to face double judgment. To some degree, who would want to be a leader? To some degree, who would want the mantle of leadership and authority over a home, a marriage, a church? Because that person will face double judgment. That is a scary prospect, and no woman should desire it because it's prohibited. And any man that desires it better be sure he's called of God and equipped of God, because any failure in that area is it brings about eternal loss. Powerful, powerful. Well, Philip, your book has really been an encouraging tool, um, especially to women who, I, I'm, I feel like where I'm going to use it is to women who really don't see their value or their responsibility within the local body of believers. And and you have said this very well. We have we've talked about the beauty of the home and those things, but God didn't just say home only. It, it's not either or. It's both. And so we have this responsibility and I I champion this with my women um, as a women's ministry leader. What is your giftedness? What are the gifts that God gave you that are to be used within the local body? Because if you're not using them, our body, men and women, are going to suffer. And so I am always looking to come alongside them, um, encourage them in using it, uh, What them, if it's more than one gift, right, to develop those gifts through discipleship through, it can be a cup of coffee, it can be handing them a book that will challenge them, uh, it can be teaching on a subject, and so I, we are on the same page, and even uh, David and I were talking this morning of how uh, you and he would be on the same page in, the, in this area, and uh, we're just so thankful to have someone who is like-minded, but you know, as a pastor to women, as a husband to your beautiful wife, um, and as a, a father to three beautiful daughters, and now a granddaughter, you are, like you said, you are in the dormitory with women. We just want you to conclude with something to encourage our audience of women um, as just a final few words here. Yeah, I'd encourage them 
to, as, as kind of the, the order of the book, recognize God has called you to be a helper and God has called you to be a life giver. Um, trace the feminine thread through scripture and be amazed at the amazing women that you'll find there that God has used and remind yourself that God wants to use you. And that's when we get into chapter three in the book, uh, that, 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 you know, God has got uh, many things for a woman to do. I highlight seven. And I, and I want to challenge the, the, the ladies that are listening to this podcast. Don't rob your church. God has given you spiritual gifts. You're a priest in Christ. And, and as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, the Spirit of God has sovereignly, you know, distributed gifts to men and women. And when you ha- don't function, uh, in the fullness of who you are in Christ, you are robbing yourself of eternal reward, and you are robbing the church of its strength. And the sooner that women get off the bench and into the game, sorry for the male analogy, you know, the, the better for the church, the better for the culture, the better for them. And I'd encourage them to get the booklet and, and to read chapter three. I, I, I went through the Gospels. I went through the book of Acts, the, the ministry of prayer. The, the ministry of spiritual mothering, the ministry of, of giving, the ministry of hospitality, uh, the ministry of mercy and compassion, the ministry of teaching God's word to your children, to other women, and alongside your husband in discipleship, and the ministry of song, like, like Miriam, um, and worship. That's just seven I highlighted. I'm sure if, I, if we look closer, there are more. But uh, there were multiple verses and passages that reinforced those that sevenfold calling. That's rich. That's fulfilling. Think of, you know, uh, prayer and, and spiritual mothering and teaching God's Word and enhancing the worship of the church. And that, that's beyond motherhood, which is itself a high calling. I, I just want to lay that challenge before the women. You know, William Booth. I, I, you know, I know we, we can we could pick this quote apart, but I do enjoy it. He had, he he said some of the best men I have is are women, and uh, you know, speaking about the the women in the Salvation Army who were on the front lines of ministry alongside him, making an impact in the inner cities of Britain. I, I just I just hope women uh, get fired up and uh, see their value. To those who are wounded, um, you know, stop nursing the wound. Uh, Let the grace of God heal it. Um, Let the Spirit of God renew your sense of of worth in Jesus Christ, uh, that you've been bought by the blood of Christ. You've been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You've been gifted by Him for the um, building up and the nurturing of the church to full maturity. Uh, Come alongside and under your husband if you're married. Come under and alongside biblical leaders in the church and exercise your priesthood and your purpose in Jesus Christ. Live that to its full breadth and beauty. That would be my word. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, Philip. You're preaching to the choir here. So (laughs) we support you 100%. Um, Thank you so much for being on the show. We really appreciate you. And we trust that this book will be a valuable resource for many women. And I know I'm making it available to all the women at my church event this spring as a gift for attending our uh, event. Um, Because I I want women to see uh, God's value for them through their use within the body of Christ. As you have said over and over, it is a beautiful thing. And so we are going to be uh, doing that, as a matter of fact, next month. And if you are interested in purchasing the booklet, You Go Girl, How Women Build the Church, you can find it on ktt.org. And that is ktt.org. That's easy. Uh, We just really want to thank you for our listeners joining us on the podcast, as well as Philip. And we look forward to the next podcast where uh, we will be teaching and encouraging women from God's word. And Shelby, we will be speaking specifically on what? On postpartum depression, how we can minister effectively with the word of God to women in our church that are suffering usually silently in that Mm -hmm. way. And so Mm -hmm. I look forward to talking with you about that. I'm looking forward to it too. You've actually written a a help booklet 
on that. Yeah, it's not published yet, but it's forthcoming. Yes, I'm, <laughs> I'm really excited for uh, the women that will read that book and for you as it as it gets published. So women, we thank you for listening. Go to the Word of God. Make sure you have discovered the gifts that God has given you, and you go, girl. Thank you for listening to the Women's Hope Podcast of the Masters University. For more resources and episodes, visit masters.edu slash women's hope. For more information on the Masters University, visit masters.edu. We'll see you next time.